All right, welcome back to the Polonize podcast. My name's Mars, this is Shirov, and today we're talking all about simulations, performance, high performance uh, in startups and also in sport. Today we're coming to you live from Fortress Melbourne, one of the biggest esports and gaming venues in the Southern Hemisphere. And what a perfect place to talk about performance and simulation. Shirov, how are you doing? Man? <laughs> really good, really good. Great to be here at Fortress. I love this place. It's amazing. It's great. How many people don't know about it? So if you're in Melbourne or in Sydney, you need to get down here. You need to get the family down here and it's get you your friends down here and get into gaming, get into performance. Mm, definitely. I haven't been to the Sydney one. Have you been to the Sydney one? Um, I, I haven't been there, but I've heard it's great. It's yeah. Great. It's Melbourne. It's really nice. Yeah, this is great. We're lucky to be here a little early and feels like we're in Valhalla <laughs> sitting yeah, in by the fire. fire <laughs> Chat with yeah. the pixelated fire. Uh, thank <laughs> the <you>. Minecraft fire. <laughs> <laughs> well, I wanted to start with that in talking about simulation performance, perfect frame, the esports performance frame. Uh, one of those, one of the first questions is, yeah, what do you see the parallels between esports and startups in terms of performance and in terms of being able to simulate uh, a scenario f- to, uh, to accelerate performance? Yeah, it's it's actually all around us, this concept of simulation. If you think about it, that in many domains where you get humans performing to a higher level, they're training themselves through simulation. Here are three examples that we're all, we're all very aware of. What is sport? Uh, training in sport is essentially doing the skills, but then going through the same process as a game. You know, you go through, you play games, you practice, there's a simulation and that training then gets you ready for the real thing. So when you're in the real thing, it's not new for you because mm. the risk is that you go into something without having done it before. Same thing in, uh, actually the high performance industries of the military and space, they're both exactly the same. We know that the military, for example, war games. Mm. everything mm. the last thing they want to do is get into a a real situation a conflict and not know what to do and the way they do that is they play out every scenario they're very very rigorous about that mm. so the consequence of that is high performance the consequence of that is complete readiness and they make decisions based on that so for example they'll buy the weapons and the planes and so on that they need based on the scenarios they've created not the other way around they don't just get able to go and buy missiles Mm. And then the third one, of course, being here in Fortress is gaming, you know, gaming and esports and that whole world. And it's not an accident that some of the first games were simulations. So I'm of the generation that can remember those. So back in the 80s, Microsoft released the first flight simulator. It was literally blocks on a screen. But even at that low, low, low resolution, terrible sound, by the way, hated the sound. Uh, even at that low resolution, it gave that feeling of being in a plane and actually the dynamics and the physics and the decision making and, and, and steering and so on. So we all know that that genre of game is very, very popular. Um, basically driving, you know, all those driving games. And uh, uh, I can say now that my oldest son, Arjun, is 17 and he is actually learning to, you know, shift and getting a feel for um, steering and so on. Yeah, great. Before he's driving. Before he's driving. Yeah. And of course, we all know about movie, Gran Turismo. Mm-hmm. So simulation is a very, very strong in both gaming entertainment side of things, but also in the serious, serious performance space and also in, in sport. So this is not new at all. All, all that we're doing here is really um, looking at the value of it and bringing it into a much you know, wider community. Now mm-hmm. that, it, that, that this is the time we can do that with technology. It's great. And speaking of war games, the... They've been doing war games since the late 1800s. It's not, it's not a new concept for them. Right. They've been training uh, army officers to be in those high-stress situations for a long time. This is something that, that's been around for a while. I love this quote, actually, from one of the world's leading st- statisticians who a lot of that war game stuff was based on. His name was George Box, and he says, All simulation models are wrong, but some are useful. The question is, how right do they have to be to be useful? Yes. Saying that simulations are never going to be perfect copies of the real world because every live scenario has its own nuances but it's about how much of it needs to be right needs to be simulated in order for you to get value out of that simulation and we see that in sport we see that in in gaming quite a lot uh something we don't see in business which is what which is what we're talking about now is how do you map that to business so you can actually train for high performance in business yeah well that's where we're at it's it's very interesting simulation is a great way to train and in business because the approach is not there, 
you do get value off a very low base, even if you get basic simulations into business. Um, I'll give you an example this week, spending some time at a very large technology firm with the remote teams all over the world. They experience a lot of the very common problems that technology teams have in coordinating teams across time zones, coordinating their work communication, collaboration, independent problem solving. And the problems they have manifest um, this week, for example, there was a clear example where two people worked on something, didn't communicate, it broke the software. There was an unhappy customer. So this is very, very uh, business focused to think about these problems. Now, in that situation, even a basic, simple scenario, which takes the whole team through, let's say, a a, a software modification process, you know, fixing things, putting them into the code base, coordinating on that, making sure that things are right. That simulation has value because it allows people to go through that before it happens. That's one type of simulation. Another type of simulation, which the military also does, is simulating a crisis. You've been attacked. What do you do? And same, same thing over here in a team. You could simulate that customer problem. And that would train people on the support and, and the communication they need to do with the customer to manage that before it happens. Mm. And it's, uh, it's really a no-brainer to do that before it happens rather than wait for it to happen. And actually, that's unfortunately where a lot of teams are at now is that they're, because they're not running these simulations and thinking in a scenario way, they're just looking at individual skills. When this thing happens, people really don't know what to do because they haven't had the experience. Mm. Skills are building blocks, but you put them together in a scenario as an experience. Yeah, and it's also, <clears throat> it also talks to the fact of how training that is done at the moment. It's done in low pressure, low stress situations, which is not the situation that work actually happens in. If you're on even a sales call, uh, you can see in, in terms of even simulations that run in the army, even flight simulators, uh, they put you in a stressful situation. Gaming is great for that as well. There's, there's time pressure. There's that type of pressure which puts you in a stressful situation because that's when you actually, uh, it, your, your mind in that time is actually why completely different and makes decisions in totally different ways. So training in low stress environments, in workshops is actually detrimental because you're not firing the proper neuro pathways to, to actually train for the, the stress of the situation. Mm. Yeah, there, there, there is a place for foundational skills training. Mm. I guess you would say, again, to take an analogy, say you're a soccer team, uh, you want those foundational skills. Someone can go home independently and you know, kick that ball up up and down so they get their basic core skill, basic dribbling skills, basic ability to kick, things like that. Mm. But it's the combination of that into real scenarios that truly brings out the value. So once mm. you have those foundational skills, that, mm. that can be done in a more linear way. That could be, you know, um, just something you do alone on your computer or what have you. But mm. once you have those skills, putting them together is really the critical thing at the next level. And that does require a, a scenario approach because it's only in context that you can put them together. Let's talk mm. about th that sales example for, you know, we could say that you're a good communicator. We could say that you're a, a good strategic thinker. Um, maybe you're good with emotional intelligence. You can understand people, build rapport. All of those are foundational skills, but you could still fail in the real sales call. Like mm. I said, you could fail to integrate that. Maybe you don't respond well under pressure and you, you lose that mm. skill, you know, or maybe you're not able to combine your communication well enough with the problem solving and you get stressed. There's so many ways that the combination can fail. Mm. Um, so skills and skill sets inside the scenario is really the complete, the complete. Yeah. And it also helps people train for their own unique way of learning. So for instance, I've recently been diagnosed with ADHD and I, I maintain and learn in a very different way than most people. And I only really see that within a particular situation. So even using Polonize, some situations are, uh, uh, make me realize, ah, that's actually my weak point. I need to train that particular thing because I don't retain information as well as I could. So I need to practice something that uh, maybe helps me on the, at the beginning of a, you know, if I'm doing a sales call or something like that, I need to study the script properly and understand some possible scenarios. Uh, so when I'm in that, in that scenario, I can choose which direction to go. So yeah, I think scenarios are great for different learning types as well. Yeah, this yeah. is actually very important for tech teams, they're often quite neurodiverse. They're often um, di very different types of personalities. Many of them are introverted, for example. And these teams do have problems because of exactly what you said. They don't cater for those different ways of learning and working together. Mm. 
uh, their systems are typically one um, platform which might need you to just work in one mode or learn just from text, for example. Mm. As you said, you may find that difficult and it's not your natural mode. So putting people into scenarios exactly highlights what you said. It shows where people can get into their high performance zone, which scenarios and which scenarios they're not in a high performance zone and they need to train for. Mm. It's often the first step that we're we're doing with organizations is just to analyze the team in this way, but to do it with the simulation scenario approach brings out uh, a, a map, if you like, that otherwise you, you never have. So that first step already is very valuable because the conversation can then be had. I could say to you, look, you're working remotely. Uh, I can see through this exercise that um, you know remote communication across time zones is difficult for you the way we do it. So we've decided to do it differently, for example, just as, a, as an example. So there's a lot of decisions you can already make even before the trade to just make the work, work better. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, and it's uh, the interesting thing there, we spoke about this yesterday as well, is training by yourself is one thing, but training as part of the team or, or having a, understanding the aggregate training of a team is super important because like, like, like sport, you know, we see teams like uh, the All Blacks, for, for instance, you know, they're not just one of the best rugby teams, they're actually one of the best sporting teams in the world. 77% uh, win ratio, amazing, amazing performance. And they have this thing which is called uh, sweep the sheds, they call it. So it's, it's, a, it's a way of humbling themselves by the whole team, doesn't matter how fam- famous they are, getting in the dressing rooms after the games, after training, clean the dressing rooms, everyone does it, everyone helps. And it creates this sense of equality in the team, uh, but also yeah, it keeps that... Uh, that glue, that mesh that keeps the team together, that un, yeah. uh, the thing that's greater than the sum of its parts. Yeah. Uh, that's really that's really interesting in, t- in terms of a training context. It's very powerful. All training of, uh, and high performance that works has that shared experience. If mm-hmm. you like, shared experience is very, very key to bonding, but it's foundational to training a team. Um, with technology now, we have a possibility for that in, at an amazing scale. You don't need to get people in the same room. You can use a platform to have people in completely different countries coming together. The problem with most of the prevailing approaches is though that they haven't been designed with that word experience in mind. Mm. They've been designed as functional things. So you could jump jump onto say Slack and message each other all day or, or on Jira to fix bugs or go to GitHub to, to put your software in and deal with issues. These are all functional platforms. They're great. They work really well functionally, but they don't create a shared experience. What we find is even with a simple colonize campaign simulating work, when the team does it together, uh, and they can do it asynchronously, but it's still a shared experience to see the performance. How did people do? Who did well at this? Who did well at that? And that, that leaderboard. That shared experience creates uh, a space for collaboration and, and, and competition and conversation, which is actually very different to a meeting. It's very different to a Zoom call. It's uh, very different to you know, a Slack a thread. A uh, quick example again on the particular customer we're consulting to this week, speaking about um, communication styles. One of the comments their executives made was uh, that this particular person in the team interacted with Polonize and said things in Polonize that they would never have said they have because yes. that meeting mode in that verbal mode and, and, and there's that, you know, the managers there and so on, that person doesn't volunteer that information. Absolutely. But... Um, given this collaborative environment here, they were able to sort of immerse themselves in that, and you actually get that communication back, which is a benefit of the gaming approach. Is that there is that sense of of fun, or that sense of competition, which is important to performance. Uh, it's it is a two way thing. You're being challenged on the spot. It's not like you know. I remember sitting through. I I did spend some time in in, in my corporate days in companies like Arup and also Vic Roads, and the training was just so boring. And there's just no way that you retain information that way, just one way being spoken to. You need to put it in practice through simulations, but also the gaming approach is important for that because it, it helps maintain attention and focus on the actual task. That's super important. This is something uh, as we interview and interact with people, large organizations down to small, I would say that uh, negative experiences of training, especially through technology mm. and organizations and but- Again and again, I hear that it's boring, it's long-winded. Um, I heard of a five-hour training exercise yesterday, which was sitting in front of a computer for three to five hours. Mm. So these, these are not thought through as human experience. Mm. So 
these are technologists building technology and data experiences. Yeah. And unfortunately that's, that impacts people. And, um, I've, I've had same thing, you know, I've had, and, and really that changes your view of the workplace. Uh, um, the kind of place you want to work is not that place that makes you go through a five hour filling out a five hour form. Yeah, for sure. Yep. Yeah. And some of these, I mean, not all organizations are made for high performance and we've seen that we've seen a lot of tech jobs being culled in the past uh, 12 months and that's because I think they've realized that there's so much bulk in these teams that there's so much work that's not getting done because there's just too many people there's there's a, a very low performance environment uh, so I think companies on all scales are realizing that high performance is needed and that challenging their staff uh, not in a negative way we're saying we're trying to we we're adopting a method that makes sure people are actively participating in their daily work habits it's not like we're doing an amazon and you're timing everything from toilet breaks to to yeah to how how quick you pack and with with this approach that ever happens because it is gaming one of the principles of gaming is autonomy and um, that ability to move through in your way and and get your performance in your way Mm. this is key to what gaming actually is how that translates to the team is that when you simulate and take people through scenarios people find their win zones as we call it so what you're good at, and, mm. and everyone can see that. The transparency is really key here as well. So if you are that person who's excellent at independent problem solving, then knowing that from the team and then putting you into that role is a win-win, mm. right? And this is what happens at the first instance already. Um, we see that a lot in our early engagements with uh, organizations. So it's good for everyone. Uh, in terms of the high performance and the low performance, I would say that there's two sides to this. At one end of the spectrum is high performance unequivocally you care about high performance such as the space industry such as nasa such as you know small high performing startup teams that are trying to take on the market etc at the other end it's not so much high performance as it is a risk thing actually so if you're hiring let's say a thousand people for a call center performance matters to the extent that you need competence you need people to be able to do the task maybe they need to be able to communicate at a basic level um, and do a basic amount of problem solving and the risk of them not doing that is quite high. You have unhappy customers, you have mm. failure. And so performance there is more thinking about risk as a team and as an organization. And typically those are larger teams that we're talking about. And they have no good way to train and hire. Uh, again, a quick story speaking to the careers section of one of the largest universities in our region. Uh, they were speaking about what one of, one of the people I was speaking to used to work in BPOs and, and call centers and said that um, they used to train... I think it was a few hundred people in the call center one by one and the enormous amount of staff, 30 staff or 40 staff they had to have just to do that training. So there's no good way to manage risk of those large teams. So that's another thing that we're really helping organizations with is, um, it is, is getting people to the point where they're doing the job well. Okay. And then at the other end of the spectrum is getting people to the point where they're world-class, beating the world. There is also a third part for job simulation within that job readiness category, especially for younger cohorts that are coming out of university that don't have that experience. One thing we hear a lot from from those university students we speak to is that they don't have two to three years experience, yet all the jobs they're applying for require two to three years experience. So how are they supposed to get that experience uh, when they're fresh out of university? And job simulation is a, is a great way to do that. If, if those organizations uh, uh, adopted some kind of simulation to train people, at least you would come in to a certain uh, that youth that youthful energy and that youthful uh, those those skill sets that are coming in and that, that unique perspective is coming into your organisation at a particular benchmark and you can uh, you can s- speed up that process through a sim- simulated job process. Yeah, this is a, a gap strategically that we're really looking to fill, and it's also very important from the education side of things. Higher education is highly competitive around the world, and one of the biggest differentiating factors is employability. Students paying for education want to get great jobs everywhere in the world. And increasingly, that is a key critical part of the equation. Um, not just the education, but the, the employability that comes from that. Um, th- this is something that all higher education institutions need to put front and center of their strategy right now. Otherwise, they're losing in the market. And we can see that happening. Um, a great education without employability isn't what the new generation of students won. Hmm. So filling that gap is important for the education sector. As as you said, it's also important for business to get job ready. So 
that gap does need technology. And we've got the beautiful time here of technology coming in. And with AI, we're able to do this really fast and at scale, whereas before you had to fill it in one by one, you know. Um, that university I spoke to, they have two careers people for 80,000. Yeah, wow. That's huge. Well, a, a great example of job readiness with uh, simulation in job readiness is the Royal Flying Doctor Service, who they were having quite a difficult time bringing in new pilots because they're usually flying into high stress situations, uh, at emergency situations, and they had no way of training their pilots for that uh, particular activity. So they installed, uh, two years ago, they installed a flight simulator called Mission Fit. And so now they're, they're able to train their pilots to actually fly into these emergency situations, which uh, increase their ability, their confidence to fly into these situations. So great, flight simulator is always a great, a great example. Well, this is exactly why we're doing what we're doing on the business side. We're saying, launch your own Mission Fit. Uh, immediately. Uh, well, then also the reason why we hand so much control over those simulations to our customers and partners. They're the ones who know how to design that, but with the help of AI, that's a very quick process. Uh, um, press of a essentially. So uh, this capability has always been there, but it's been a high cost thing to create a simulation. Uh, um, and that, that approach has been taken by certain people that they haven't been able to scale it. And it's been static. You might spend a lot of time building a simulation, but a year later, you can't change it. Uh, with the platform that we're bringing here to market, it's extremely dynamic and can happen at any time. And so that capability now becomes is something you can embed into an organization, do it every day if you want. Mm. And that's super fun to do, that process of inputting a job description or a training module and having a simulation come out. That's quite, that's quite interesting. And then tweaking it from there, making it specific, that's the power that AI gives us now is the ability to do that at speed and, and actually with great accuracy as well. It's also uh, really interesting in the, uh, just going over to um, the, the world of primary or high school education. We have a couple of non-commercial partners in Europe and in South America who are exploring this using Polonize. And one of the insights I got from one of them this week was that uh, this approach, taking a lesson plan, for example, and turning it into an interactive simulation mm -hmm. is not only great for students, but really great for teachers. And this is key that, uh, I think ed tech often forgets, you know, that their real customer is the teacher. You have to make their life better. Their life's not easy as it is, right? So turning something that's essentially static, they've already worked on, but turning it into an interactive experience for, say, burning students at the press of a button, that's a huge problem solve for a, for a teacher because they've turned static information into an experience. And into something that's fun and dynamic and interactive, which is great for the kids as well. Yeah. And, yeah. and you're going to hold... 30, 40 minute lesson, they're just talking about the conversations and the skills and, and all that stuff. Uh, we also wanted to talk a little bit about the, the skills of the future, especially in a post AI world, training is important because we're, we're moving into a totally different uh, modality of, of work because you have this co-pilot at your side at all times. And I like this idea of uh, the T-shaped talent, the idea that talent of the future needs to be like a T. It needs to be deep in one particular area, but broad across a lot of areas. So it can do many, uh, so in each individual, especially in a startup, you see this uh, extremely necessary where someone has a depth of skills of say coding, but they also can do a bit of marketing. They also can do a bit of project managing that have that breadth of skills as well as that depth. Super important in a post AI world. Uh, very important for startups, we know that. Mm. And the reason why we've started to actually tackle those two with slightly different training campaigns. I'll give you an example. In the sales training process, there's a place for that really broad training campaign or simulation, which takes someone through all the steps of sales, right from prospecting a lead generation, right through to closing and, and even account management. That process has a huge amount of skill sets and different scenarios in it. And is often the way you start by mapping people on that. But then looking at specialists and training them deeply, for example, in sales, the art of uh, you know, engaging a customer with the demo. That might be a really deep, specific thing. It's a critical point though, you, know, you lose customers at that point. So you can now then start to train people. And we've already started now to build us first training simulations and campaigns that go deep into a skill. Uh. So I think actually this is exactly the model that, that's coming out is that you have a combination of those broader campaigns, but you also yeah, definitely. And that's, that's what we've seen and we've been playing a lot with that. So let's switch gears and talk about, and then we've been talking about training a lot, but let's talk about uh, simulation within the hiring environment, which we've been doing quite a bit of. 
a slightly different use case, but definitely uh, still something that is is quite necessary uh, in the hiring process. We we speak to a lot of recruiters, we speak to a lot of uh, managers, and that the process now is totally broken. Uh, what does what does simulation do in that environment where you where you're looking for talent? You're looking to build a high performance team, uh, but you don't know this person. So how can simul how can simulations benefit that scenario? Well, actually, it is. Uh, I want to point out that the benefit comes from training and on ramping people into your job through the simulation initially. So training is part of this. Training is to on ramp into hiring. Mm that has never been there. Um, the on-ramp into hiring has been broken. People essentially, essentially are coming in with historical data, which has nothing to do with your job. But as soon as you simulate the job and put people through it, if you think about it, they're already getting, mm. getting a little bit of training. You're, you're actually onboarding before you hire. And the de-risking of that in terms of hiring is enormous. And we're starting to really demonstrate that in the market by the quality of candidates you get through. These people already are a fit in a way that no other process can give you. So that's the first thing, that training is part of what we're speaking about here. In terms of then looking at what happens next and the outcomes that come out of that, that de-risking means that you can start to be really um, human with those candidates. What I mean is that if you're interviewing five people who you know have done your simulation, your specific custom simulation and performed well, then you can start that conversation already knowing so much about that person that you can really then spend time with that person, get to know them mm. and understand, you know, how they think, how they feel. And that interview becomes a lot better. So that level two experience, which, you know, level one being the, the initial simulations using technology, but then the level two experience is a human experience of a job interview. Uh, that is much better. And because that's much better, you then hire better. Mm. Right? So you get to know people. So really it is about getting to know people. Uh, and the missing piece has always been, how do you onboard people into a hiring? Um, the real hiring happens in this type of situation, human to human. But the broken part has been the way that we've brought people into that environment. It, it, there's no good way to do that until now. Yeah, and the importance of trial and error within that training environment, because that's the best way we learn as humans, is you try something, it doesn't work, you try a different way. And Tradition, traditionally, it's always been a binary thing of right or wrong. You've done this exam, you've answered these questions, they're wrong, they're right. That feels so so static and uh, it's not contextual enough for someone to really get that training out of that situation. But when you simulate something, you're able to get a lot deeper into uh, the, 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 the details of that particular experience, that particular position, what's needed, the skills needed. And you're also able to see, able to, able to see someone's enthusiasm, their passion, their, uh, their perseverance and persistence to be able to lose and learn and then get better, which we've seen plenty of times in our platforms. Those, some of our favorite players have been those that have lost once, twice, but then the third time they come back and they do great. So that trial and error is super important in this equation as well. Absolutely. And those MVPs, as we call them, mm. come out of the process. And you can see how by doing the simulation, by having the, the scoring, creating tangible leaderboards. So in Usually these things you spoke about are all intangibles, but by making it tangible and having that, that scoring and data, you're then able to move to competition. And that open, transparent competition brings out high performance. And there's a lot of value in those MVPs because those MVPs will often surprise you. And what we find is they go beyond the job role. So we're bringing in, say, sales partners to do sales, but the MVPs already start to speak to us in a strategic way. They start to help us. Think maybe they'll help us design our lead generation. Maybe they can... Um, you know, talk to us about sales strategy and maybe they turn into, you know, the, the leaders that we're looking for in that sales team. That just happens naturally through this process. Yeah, for sure. And with that process, I wanted to touch a little bit on uh, the idea of benchmarking performance, which is something we do within a platform. Uh, explain that, how it works in Polonize first, and we'll talk about that in a broader sense of the importance of benchmarking for performance. Right. So when we ran simulations, we realized early on in our experimentation uh, that there needs to be a benchmark for performance so that you can measure against. Um, every good measurement system has a benchmark. For example, in IQ, there's some sort of benchmark that was set by a test uh, and so on. So in our Polonize approach, we realize that that benchmark needs to be dynamic and in the control of 
um, either the customer is building the simulation or there needs to be a way to generate that as well. So what we've done is we've built a system which can benchmark for you. You can create a scenario and AI can create a good or average response to the challenge and the scenario in such a way that it's a benchmark. But increasingly what's happening is our, uh, our customers like to set that. So for example, they may create a simulation in the consulting world of bringing um, grads, grads to give them an experience of a real consulting case, but they'll benchmark that by bringing in one of their uh, existing consultants to also answer that scenario. So now the, the, the new candidates are benchmarked against an existing expert. And you can calibrate that. You can have someone really difficult, uh, really sophisticated play set up very difficult benchmark. You'll get most people won't get through for the vast majority, or you can lower it. And again, that, that's a really important control because as the use cases that I was talking about before, uh, sometimes you want um, basic level competence, but sometimes you want really high performance and mm. benchmark high. Uh, so, so that's how we've implemented it. It's nothing new, but it, we've brought it into this domain where it can be created very quickly. And the value of it is that you can set that benchmark and calibrate your uh, your game campaign simulation the way that you want to. Mm. I actually do think it's it's quite new and innovative, innovative in a sense that we see benchmarking used a lot, obviously, in sport. Uh, teams like the US swim team, they train with a very uh, specific benchmark in mind and they have those partic particular measurements available. They know that the world record for 100 meter freestyle is this benchmark and so they're training to specifically hit that benchmark and working out what what performance do I need to get to hit that benchmark that's that's a uh, one level of benchmarking because it's quite it's quite static it's a it's a set level but what you're talking about and what we do in Polonize is very contextual it's you're talking about within not only a company or a job but it's in a particular scenario and benchmarking someone's performance in that specific scenario that that's pretty that's pretty nuanced and pretty innovative there I think yeah, well, what it does, I mean, by bringing that concept into that contextual scenario the way we've done, it allows us to build a lot of data and scoring. Mm. And that's where the real innovation and opportunity comes because now that you can actually look at performance in this tangible way over time as well, uh, the value starts to come from that. Mm. that. You know, as long as the benchmarks aren't there, the measurements or the, the um, ability to measure consistently is also not there. And so that's foundational to then all the next things that happen. You measure consistently, you can now train to that measurements, analyze, and then you can move forward to higher using that data. And, and as we go forward in time, we're going to see how this permeates through the organization, both before hiring and after hiring this, this benchmarking. Mm. And it's, it's an important mental shift, shift as well, because there is a clear difference between benchmarking in sport and benchmarking in business in sport. There's a very finite thing you you know like in gaming. You have to win a game, or is it 45 minutes and a half of, of soccer, 90 minutes? That's your time frame. You perform within a certain time frame. In in business, sometimes those boundaries can be a little ambiguous. Uh, we see a lot of uh, tech organisations now doing sprints, one week sprints, one month sprints. That gives it a little more context, but that creating those boundaries is important because you need to be able to say, okay, we're going from A to B here, and then we measure. We adjust and move forward. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, because it's been impossible to measure performance contextually at a fine grain, we've ended up with measuring it at a very coarse level and benchmarking people to that coarse level. Let me give you an example. Uh, in sales, because we can't look at performance until now, we couldn't look at performance inside of scenarios we decided we would just benchmark by how many sales you did a quarter. And that would be the benchmark. You either make it or you don't. You fly to Vegas or you get sacked. Mm -hmm. That's that's sales, right? Uh, and so that leads to a really not a, not a positive environment because you're not actually benchmarking or, it, or it's totally at the wrong level. So now we're starting to really move teams into thinking much more contextually using the technology. They can see how you're doing on a daily basis and we can adjust. And, and then you can still have that prize. You can still fly the team somewhere. Uh, mm -hmm. But everyone feels like it's been a much fairer process and um, transparency again I'll, I'll bring that up I'll bring that up transparency here is really yeah. important it, the typical scenario of managers taking you into a room and talking about your KPIs has been opaque and secretive almost and culturally damaging organizations mm. and we find as soon as we open things up and make it transparent on this on this leaderboard it actually is such a positive it just opens up people to conversation. Mm. Um, 
this, and, the, and, and then you can look at the team like a sports coach looks at their team uh, with spirit of performance but also collaboration and and you know really just just such a such a great environment compared to the uh. you know, secretive opaque environment that usually exists. Mm, well speaking of opaque and secretive that's pretty much the hiring process as well the transparency in the hiring process is super important you're usually looking at something super ambiguous like a resume but putting candidates through a simulation of the job you're hiring for gives you the chance to actually open up that entire process and see how they perform before you even speak to them before you even have that interview that's that's super useful for a team and they even though they're anonymized to an ex large extent they can see where they stand mm. it's not about knowing who's who it's knowing about where you are now that's a big cultural shift that we're bringing to the market and not everyone's going to be ready for that a lot of people are against that you know and they don't want transparency but technology does this every time it breaks open uh, what used to be an opaque market that was intermediate and into a transparent open market think about airbnb for example you can go there and you can see on a map everywhere that you can stay and you get to choose um not you know the old process of calling up a travel agent who gives you their preferred hotel <laughs> which is what it was you know 30 40 years ago yeah all right, let's shift gears and talk more about uh, the bigger picture in terms of simulation and how that can help not only people that are already in the, in the drum, job market, but what we've seen is through Polonize, we're getting some amazing talent globally come up from India, Nigeria, uh, South America. Uh, talent that wasn't able, used to be able to come through the cracks are now being seen and now being noticed because they're given an even playing field to play and compete through these simulations. So what are, what are some of the things you've observed about talent coming through from those other countries? Yeah, it's it's been so interesting to see a tier of talent come through that normally doesn't get a chance. Uh, resumes and that game of what degree and what qualification you have. That game shuts people out because really you only get attention in that game if you've gone to the top universities. And it's a status game, isn't it? So if you're lucky enough to get into an Ivy League university or if you're lucky enough to be in an IIT, for example, in India, then the opportunities are going to be there for you. Polonize is much more interesting to those who have the skills but don't have that pathway. And they're often self-taught. They're often what you might call hustlers. Mm. So they've really uh, had to make do with a lot less resources. Maybe they come from poor backgrounds, um, but they're very motivated. Um, you see these kinds of people in sales. You see them in marketing. You see them in content marketing. You've seen them uh, come through from Nigeria, for example. But you also see them in other fields, all fields, in fact. Um, it's an enormous untapped talent pool and we're at the beginning of a journey but we're starting to see the first examples of that coming through it's, it's very exciting to see and it's actually also uh, really I guess rewarding to know that you can make that impact in people's lives through something like this uh, it does have to be a new approach they know that it has to be different and that's why they're ready to adopt they're ready for change whereas um, if you're already in a great university with all the big brands chasing you, why would you want change? Mm. Yeah, and this is a, a massive global market we're tapping into because we just had a conversation yesterday with a company called Deal and uh, they've built a billion dollar company on uh, essentially arbitraging talent and taking care of the uh, HR side of it for remote talent across the world. So I think people are taking notice that remote work is here to stay and it's opening up an entire market of amazing talent globally and that's generally been the issue is how do you hire someone in Nigeria or hire someone in India and so those problems are now being solved by technology so now we, we have a uh, truly a global talent pool to work with. Correct and what's interesting is there's a global talent pool if you like within large organizations their teams are distributed and that's a pool of talent who's working together already but similar problems there, you know, cultural differences, uh, communication, and they don't really know their global teams. Uh, so many examples where these two countries are supposed to work together, but they just don't even talk barely, or they really don't know each other, you know? And so at the macro level, there's geopolitically, there's a huge shift going on. Um, big, big talent pools, as we keep talking about in places like Nigeria and, and India, that are completely invisible to Western companies. They have no idea, for example, if you're a Western company, you're only really interacting with the top five cities in India, generally, and getting talent from there. You have no idea that there's another 50 to 100 tier two cities, as they're called, hmm. full of talent, some of which is world beating and way beyond an IoT graduate. But you have no idea. You're just working in the old paradigm and you're missing out. 
when we bring that talent to you, then you can see it. And this simulation approach gives them a pathway that they're hungry for. They want to do it this way. They don't want to be sending their resume a hundred times over. It's not even getting read by yeah. HR. Yeah. And some of those stats we saw last week prove that less than 15, 10% of, of, of recruiters are actually reading these resumes in the first place. It's total overload for them on, on their behalf, especially in a market like this, which is saturated with great talent at the moment. There, there, there is a lot of talent open on the market. So uh, recruiters and hiring managers uh, having to read two, three, five hundred resumes, which is it's impossible. It's impossible. It's, yep. it's not rational to expect any human being to do that. But the system is making it unfair. It's not that they're sitting there saying, "I want to exclude people," but the system is fundamentally exclusive and not inclusive. You can't patch that with human beings. Like I said, speaking to a university, they've got a policy of inclusiveness but they've got two people to do it across tens of thousands of people. Huh. You can't do inclusiveness with human beings that way. It's impossible, huh. no matter how good your intentions. You need to put a system in place that is giving people their own opportunity to prove themselves and, and go through autonomously. And that's what we do. We really give candidates, players, students, whoever it is, especially young people, and they have the chance to do this, not someone telling them to do this. It's such a key thing that... Uh, really sets our approach apart from HR completely. Mm. Nowhere else in the world, in any HR process, does the candidate get to unlock their own interview based on performance. And that's what Polonize gives uh, gives players, and that's why our Polonize players love the process. Like I said last week, the word fun and recruiting have never belonged together mm. until now. Because if they know they can get that interview and get the opportunity. Uh, it's so liberating for them. Definitely is. Great point to leave it on for today. Thanks for joining us for our special five-side edition of the Polonize podcast. Uh, if you're looking to build the train high-performance teams, check out polonize.io or contact any one of us via LinkedIn. Uh, thanks for joining us and we'll see you next week. Thank you.